You ever heard of Nancy Drew, the Hardy Boys, Tom Swift, the Bobsy Twins, the Rover Boys? It might shock you to know that all these series were written by the same people. Sometimes even by the same man. It's called the Stratemeyer Syndicate, and it was one of the most amazing stories of creating your own distribution channel in history. And I want to use it as an example today of thinking big. If you're an Amazon Kindle publisher, you're going to want to listen to this because it's going to give you the roadmap on how to be successful. Yeah, the platforms have changed in 100 years, but the mentality of people is still the same. So all those mystery series for kids are produced by this guy, Edward Stratemeyer. And Stratemeyer's genius is not that he's a great writer or creates wonderful characters <laughs> or is even that great of a marketer. But he creates a formula and holds strict control of that formula. What does that sound like to you? It sounds like a process, doesn't it? Processes. So important. So... He's the first book packager to aim his books at children. And there was a point at which, <laughs> in the mid-20s, people were believing that pretty much every book, most of the books read in the United States, were Stratemeyer Syndicate books. That's how powerful they were. And the major thing that Stratemeyer Syndicate is selling here isn't, again, the stories or the characters, but... The thrill of feeling grown up. That's what they're selling to kids. And there's some specific ways that we'll get into and in how the, they created this effect. So, if you want to produce a large number of books quickly, well, first of all, you got to write. That's the first thing. But second of all, if you want to spread out, you don't want to look like you're, you're, you're spreading yourself too thin. So, use pseudonyms, right? Uh, so... That's what Edward does. He produces these series, the initial books, as uh, being written by different people. Right? The Bobsy Twins are under the pseudonym of Laura Lee Hope. And there's values to this. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, he found out that books under pseudonyms sold better. And so his idea here is, this is a quote... He could offer more books each year if he dealt with several publishers and had the books published under a number of pseudonyms which he controlled. Again, process, strategy. He explained his strategy to a publisher saying, a book brought out under another name would, I feel satisfied, do better than another Stratemeyer book. If it was brought out under my own name, the trade on new Stratemeyer books would simply be cut into four parts instead of three. So he feels he can kind of get rid of the middleman. He starts hiring ghostwriters because the demand is greater than he's able to actually write. So let's dig into these rules. What are the, the writing rules? What's the formula, the secret for thinking big here as far as churning out content goes? Well, he says, all books will be part of a series. That's from the beginning. We're not doing one-offs and trying things out to see how they go. We are definitely making a series out of this to establish more quickly if a series is going to be successful the first bunch of, of volumes are going to be published at once so we're going to get three four five we're going to call them breeders these series and so that i mean this is brilliant it gives people something else to buy as well once they read one and like it well they don't have to wait and lose interest potentially right there's something else for them to buy right now the books would be written under a pseudonym. We covered that already. There are many benefits to this, not just the publisher thing that we talked about dealing with publishers, but it provides an apparent continuity of authorship. So an author can die. It doesn't matter. The public never sees that. And also, you can have multiple ghostwriters coming up with stuff, new books, at the same time. It just looks like Mary Lee so-and-so is really prolific, right? The books, this is key, the books will look as much like contemporary adult books as possible with similar bindings and typefaces. Remember, I said that the big thing that Edward Stratemeyer is selling here is that feeling of being a grown-up for kids, right? So this is helping sell that illusion or making it look like contemporary adult books. The books will be of a predictable length. That makes sense. We know what we're getting into. It's not 120 pages one time, 200 another, and 250 another time, right? This is critical. I love this as a writer myself. Chapters and pages, 
listen to that, chapters and pages should end in mid-situation to increase the, desire, the reader's desire to keep reading. I can't put it down. I don't know why. Well, it's designed that way. <laughs> I love it. Each book will begin with a quick recap of all previous books in that series in order to promote those books. Yes. I'm familiar with Nancy Drew. I, oh, wait, I missed that one. I'm going to go back and buy that. Mom, <laughs> we need to get that, right? Books might also end with a preview of the next volume in the series. Same thing, right? Positioning. Now, Pricing positioning. The books would be priced at 50 cents rather than the more common 75 cents a dollar or a dollar and a quarter. So you're pricing yourself as a price leader, right? You are making yourself the discount shop. It's easy for adults to buy. They can rationalize it to themselves. And the kids could also maybe afford them with their allowance or something. Who knows? And then this last one is really important too. Characters should not age or marry. So early on, he had characters in series grow up and marry, but look what happened. The sales, they drop right off. And so that promotes the syndicate to make this rule that characters should never marry. So early on, the public liked the, the syndicate books, but libraries and professionals didn't. They thought, oh, these are just trashy novels. In fact, there's a phrase called extruded book product. If you think of how a pipe is made or a channel of aluminum gutter, it's extruded. You pull it out and you cut it to length. But as time goes on, people are gradually coming around to, hey, kids are actually reading these books. Maybe they're not so bad. Maybe we should promote them. At least they're reading something, right? At least they're reading this. So you've probably heard, I mean, there's so many series. There's, I bet you, a hundred of them. The Bobsy Twins, Rover Boys, Nancy Drew, Hardy Boys, Tom Swift. There's even Tom Swift the, the Third. All these series, and you can look all these up. Man, they just go on and on and on, all the way up into the 80s. Edward dies of pneumonia in 1930, and his daughters pick up the business. Initially, they want to sell it because the depression is on, but nope, <laughs> can't sell it, so they need to uh, figure out what to do with this multi-million dollar empire now, right? They have the Hardy Boys and the Nancy Drew series, and that's what they're mostly pumping out and that. And they're hiring ghost writers, giving them these formulaic extruded book product principles to run by. And uh, even as time goes on, though, I mean, all the way for like 45 years here, from the 30s through the 70s, this thing is really ticking along pumping out books, making money in that. They have to revise earlier versions of the books because times and mores of society change. So sometimes they have to have the plots change completely and come up with a new story. There's some racist text in there, cultural elements that change, so they've got to make it more wholesome in, in the 50s, 60s, and whatnot, and, uh, and fix this stuff up. Finally, it got into the 70s and 80s, there were some legal problems, a uh, question of who actually owned the rights to the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, you know, who's going to publish this stuff really ended up being a, a question. Simon and Schuster ended up buying the syndicate in 1986. Now this next bit, I got the notes straight from stratemeyer.org, which I figure is their like formal site, talking about uh, how the ghostwriting worked. And again, this could be really important to somebody who wants to follow this model. Syndicate writers are paid between $75 and $250, which might not sound like much in today's dollars, but you gotta remember inflation, right? Uh, they note that a uh, news reporter job of the day would pay $60 to $70 a month. So if you're thinking that the writers take a couple weeks to pump out one of these volumes, it's pretty good money. And that is what the Stratemeyer Syndicate is paying its writers. It's paying them a pretty good amount. They're not hiring people from the third world and trying to get them to churn out good stuff at, uh, at nickels <laughs> levels, you know. So that's something to keep in mind. Pay your writers well. Some of the writers stuck it out with the Syndicate for decades writing a hundred or more titles a piece. I mean, that's crazy, right? There's this one fellow named Howard Garris who wrote 315 book-length manuscripts. That's wild. 
to be fair, I've seen in other sources with the Great Depression, things started to drop a little bit and the syndicate had cut the compensation. Remember, there's no royalties here, right? Uh, from, you know, say $125 to about $75. And that changed things up. Some of the writers said, okay, I'm not going to work anymore. I'm not going to work on this series. If I'm going to write for less, I'm going to write for what I want to write about. And there's some other details here in an article by a fellow named James Keyline. He, he reports that the syndicate used about a hundred pseudonyms and the syndicate tried to create this impression that these pseudonyms were real people. So they'd create names for assistants and secretaries and that of these so-called famous authors so that when kids would write them, they would get a letter back from the secretary. <laughs> Some other ideas that these series uphold, which you could use, are things like adults are useless. <laughs> the kids should discover that adults are not really that good. They're corrupt or incompetent or something like that. So that the idea here is that the readers, the kids reading, don't become too reliant on adults. Uh, there's no violence so much. People don't get hit. They get tied up and a rag stuffed in their mouth so they can't yell. I love that idea of extruded book product. It's not the nicest way to describe these things, but uh, the fact that you can turn the machine on and churn out something that's of a predictable length and cut it off is, has been used. You know, we've got these kid hero, kid detective type ideas. They're snooping around and there is this formulaic plot to follow. There are no unusual plots or original plots here, right? The kids go around, they snoop into things, and in some cases actually there's no crime or mystery at all. Not so much for the Hardy Boys and Nancy Drew, but for other series there, there might be nothing. I think there's one series with a giant gentleman rabbit <laughs> that's the main character. So lest you think that the extruded book product idea is a new one. This has been going on a long time. Someone pointed out that William Shakespeare worked in uh, what they call a climate uh, where this was the norm. The audience of the, the theater is always looking for new plays. And so anything that you could put together in a few weeks is necessary for uh, a playwright who wants to be successful. Um, so they're just churning stuff out. They do point out that Shakespeare himself was kind of an odd case. Um, he had enough status as an actor and shareholder in his own company that he could produce a couple of solo authored plays a year. So he didn't have to do as much collaborative work to churn out this stuff uh, as, as some others. Alexander Dumas was uh, one of the first commercial literature writers and he had a bunch of ghostwriters to keep up with uh, the demand for new books. Supposedly he put out more than 1,200 books and he, he joked that he said that he had co-authored or had more co-authors than Napoleon had generals. You've probably heard of R.L. Stein. His Goosebumps series has, has been accused of being uh, extruded book product. He doesn't like that idea. But at the height of his series, he was popping out a new book every month and he was writing something else uh, besides another series. So <laughs> you got to wonder, does that affect quality? And of course, you may have heard of Enid Blyton, who wrote the famous Five Secret Seven, the Kids of Adventure series, uh, all that I grew up with. And she churned out so many plots that people accused her of having ghostwriters. She said, no, I didn't. But I do recall reading an interview with her that she said she did absolutely no research on names, locations, anything. She just wrote whatever the heck she felt like. <laughs> and frankly, as a kid, that was good enough for me. I really like the breeder set concept. Though. And let's finish up with that. We come out with three books, similar cover art. Remember, we're following that adult book typeset and look, maybe five, you know. Uh, you want a, this first series to be available so that people have something more to buy. So what could you do that would emulate this Stratemeyer Syndicate idea, this concept, right? Create a formula, own the formula, stick to it. Test a few things to see what works. I mean, they found out, for example, that having the characters age and get married was bad for sales. So it's like, okay, we're not going to do that anymore. And they found that out fairly quickly, too. It's not like they got 20 years into the thing and then discovered, oh, this doesn't work. And notice how long this went on for. I mean, we're looking at a, at a good 85-year career for this idea. That's pretty great. And, uh, I mean, Simon & Schuster owns it, so it's probably still going on. If you like this kind of concept, but you're struggling to come up with ideas for your own area or business, maybe we should speak. 
you can book a call to talk with me and oh, there's a heck of a lot of creativity over here. <laughs> so, thanks for listening. This is Jason Kanigan from Cold Star Technologies. <laughs>